Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Brandon Gare with the National Minority Equality Forum here, uh, proudly wearing my Xavier uh, Xavier sweatshirt. We'll be talking about the Big Easy. I know Dr. Ferdinand's a Dillard person, but we'll you know we'll we'll agree to work together peacefully today during today's uh, discussion. And plus, she has all the great information um, that everybody well, wants. I'm to an hear. alumni. Okay, there we go. You got you got another one. <laughs> it's good good to hear um well we're obviously i talked about the big easy we're talking about how to mount a successful flu campaign lessons from the big easy um as you know we do these webinars every friday to help educate the communities that we work with and serve um and before i get into just a quick brief bio of dr Ferdinand, i just want to let you know if you have any questions um that you have for the panel please insert it in the q please do it in the q a box which is on the bottom and if you have a comment or you want to make people aware of something that's happening either in your community or, or something you want to reference please put that in the chat box and get that conver uh, keep that conversation conversation going but we have dr ferdinand dr daphne ferdinand we we work a lot with the ferdinand family here at uh, the National Minority Equality Forum, but Dr. Ferdinand, this Dr. Ferdinand is the <laughs> Executive Director of Healthy Health, Healthy Heart Community Prevention Project, Inc., which is in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Ferdinand is the Executive Director, and it's a nonprofit corporation where the mission is to promote heart health and eliminate disparities associated with cardiovascular disease in vulnerable communities. So it's obviously on par with what the work that we love to promote and do at the National Minority Equality Forum. You all have sort of gotten the invitation, so you know her extensive background and resume and all her accomplishments. And so without further ado, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ferdinand to lead this discussion. Thank you so very much, Brandon. And good morning and good afternoon good to morning. those, especially on the East Coast. And welcome to How to Mount a Successful Flu Campaign, Lessons from the Big Easy, also known as New Orleans. I will serve as moderator for this, mod for this webinar today, sharing the stage with my gracious partners who were key to the success of the Flu Ready NOLA flu vaccine and educational campaign to reduce the flu virus, as well as to improve public health in New Orleans. Before I introduce the panel, I want to thank Dr. Laura Lee Hall, in the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equity for their support of this campaign in New Orleans. I'd like to introduce Ms. Karen Rogers Baptiste, who is one of our panelists. She is the Chief Visionary Officer and CEO of Bright Moments. Bright Moments has, has under their belt 40 years provision of public relations, marketing and advertising services to our New Orleans community. They have excelled in community outreach, community development, event planning, and community education initiatives. You will see why our partnership with Bright Moments was so critical to this campaign. Next, I'd like to introduce Meredith McInturf. Meredith is the Public Health Emergencies Environmental Health Manager at the New Orleans Health Department, leading a team that guides medical and public health preparedness in response to recovery from disasters and public health emergencies in Orleans Parish and includes engaging in community partnerships to promote flu and COVID vaccines to improve the public health of our community. Rashida Ferdinand, founder and CEO of Sankofa Community Development Corporation, has been working to rebuild and revitalize the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans since 2008. Their success with building and sustaining community and organizational partnerships supported the development of their current programs, such as the Fresh Start Market, the Wetland Park and Nature Trail, a food pantry, and Main Street Program, an economic development project, as well as community flu vaccine events in their Lower Ninth War community. And lastly, I'll have Dr. Calvin Williams, who is a board certified general surgeon owner and medical director of Advanced Surgical Associates, but feels most fulfilled with his volunteer work as health ministry director at Greater St. Stephen Full Gospel Baptist Church. He's been married for 41 years and a proud father of three young men. So this is our panel, everyone. So let's get started. 
And what I'll do is start getting our slides up where I will share the screen. and begin the presentation. So it's important for us to keep pressing the issue to our community members to fight the flu because it's a contagious respiratory illness caused by the influenza virus affecting the nose, throat, and the lungs. People under 65 years of age and older children younger than five, and people with certain health conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and heart disease are at higher risk for serious flu complications. The virus can also cause mild to severe illness, possibly resulting in hospitalization or even death. And the best way to reduce the risk is to get an annual flu shot. So we embarked on this campaign called Flu Ready NOLA vaccine campaign in 2022, as well as in 2024, to promote the public health efforts and encourage more people to especially those at risk to get their flu shots. So the Healthy Heart Community Prevention Project contracted with Bright Moments, a PR firm in New Orleans to help us develop this campaign and coordinate these efforts in 2022 and 24. We developed an educational campaign in the fall of 2022 called Flu Ready NOLA, coined by Bright Moments. The flyer on the slide was disseminated to the Bright Moments networks. We held four flu and COVID vaccine events at a major hospital and three community centers. We engaged a total of 12 partners from departments of city government, pharmacy, academia, community-based, and health professional organizations. But our key partners, and some of them on a panel today, were the New Orleans Health Department, Walgreens, which provided and administered the vaccines, the New Orleans Recreational Department, which provided the site for free of charge, and New Orleans East Hospital, which also offered free site and the vaccines as well. The promotions were a major effort involving canvassing yard signs, disseminating flyers into our targeted neighborhoods and promoting vaccine education on TV and radio in addition to social media platforms. But to boost our attendance, we decided to offer a $20 gift card to each one who came to our vaccine sites to receive a, a flu shot. This is a pic of the vaccine sites featuring the New Orleans Health Department Director, Dr. Jennifer Avegno. Dr. Avegno is a worker, a hard worker. She came to our site, not only to provide interviews to the reporters that showed up, but she also administered the vaccines with her staff. Here is Dr. Keith Ferdinand, who is our academic partner from Tulane School of Medicine, providing education about flu to our attendees. It was important for us to have our trusted physician messengers to be present. We had a direct delivery, of 610 vaccinations among all four sites. The New Orleans Health Department provided the number of people who received the vaccines before, which were 15,076, and after our campaign, 40,236. So we feel that the flu vaccination rates can be enhanced by doing community education using radio, internet, and other media. We wanted to take a different twist though this time with the flu ready NOLA vaccine campaign. So in January of this year, we developed a citywide promotional campaign to educate people about the benefits of getting the flu vaccine. We partnered and contracted with Bright Moments, again, to develop an educational marketing and health promotion campaign in January of 2024 to educate our citizens locally and throughout the state about the flu virus and to promote the benefits of flu vaccinations. So we re-engaged our previous partners, the New Orleans Health Department, New Orleans East Hospital, Tulane School of Medicine, Walgreens, and the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equity. 
Bright Moments developed a multi-channel campaign involving various graphics for flyers, videos, Facebook and Instagram for different types of ads, for email marketing using database from key um, organizations that they were instrumental in providing to us as well. And also directing the public to the Healthy Heart website for flu information. The videos were promoted on TV and various digital media, in addition to physician interviews on local radio stations. This is a video of our Tulane School of Medicine partner, Dr. Keith Ferdinand, talking about the risk of contracting the flu if you are living with comorbid conditions. To the right is a flyer created with all three physician partners, encouraging our public to get their flu shots during an intensely crowded carnival season. The COVID outbreak really hit us hard during carnival a few years back when COVID came on the scene. To the right is a screenshot of Dr. Jennifer Avegno, our health department director, featured in the Flu Ready Nola commercial aired on local television that had two, over 200,000 viewers and cable TV. Dr. Takesha Davis of New Orleans East Hospital, as well as Dr. Ferdinand, were also featured in similar vid videos that were publicized on television. Bright Moments also created digital ads with NOLA.com, which is an exclusive online content provider of the Times-Picayune, reaching over 3 million unique users and generating more than 36 million page views monthly for exposure on extended networks, for display ads and video, we had these digital ads placed, which meant that we had a result of over 181,000 impressions that means every time an ad is viewed by someone or in their feed, it's an impression. And it's indicated as a benchmark for visibility and reach in the digital world. And for YouTube, we had over 22,000 video completions. That means the number of times that people were actually watching these videos and being exposed to the content information, indicating that the messages were engaging and educational enough to penetrate that attention of the target audience. We also had bit a radio streaming. Radio ads were used for flu campaign initiatives, aired on a number of platforms listed to the right of the slide, including podcasts with the reach of over 79,000 listeners. We even had spots aired on a popular Latino radio station for the Spanish speaking audience. Social media was a very important part of this platform. So social media was used and cons consisted of posting 30, three 30 second videos in a static flyer through the Healthy Heart Community Prevention Project's Facebook and Instagram profiles in collaboration with posts with the City of New Orleans Health Department and the City of New Orleans Government and the New Orleans East Hospital. Digital billboards were also critical to this exposure. Bright Moments leverage vendor relationships to secure cost-effective digital billboard placement contracts that featured four high traffic locations in the greater New Orleans area. The result was over 1 million total impressions across four locations. Here's a sample of what the billboards looked like that we had in all four locations in the city. Email marketing was also very, very important. Bright Moments used their internal database with all three creative videos developing a narrative about the importance of getting the flu vaccine in the midst of an active flu season, educating the community about the importance of protecting high-risk groups, and also warning the public of flu-related complications and hospitalizations. All three campaigns garnered over 17,000 emails. In addition to the email marketing campaign, Bright Moments also used the Crew of Truth, which is a trusted source for educators and school administrators in the city, the New Orleans Tribune and the New Orleans Agenda, which is a local news and information 
uh, a news source specifically targeting African Americans. And both were locally and regionally promised a minimum estimate reach of over 280,000. These are some of the samples of the email marketing uh, campaign that was distributed throughout all of those different platforms. We also made sure that our three partnering physicians were very much involved and they all had three different messages previously mentioned about the food. We also decided to hold a community vaccine event at the New Orleans East Hospital. We felt that it was important if we did have time to do that, although this was primarily an educational and promotional campaign, that we did leverage our partnerships and our relationships with other organizations that had um, a large body of people that would be on site at the hospital. So what we did, we used the 14th annual Back to Nature Heart Walk that was back in February, which partnered with the Healthy Heart Community Prevention Project. And we decided that we would offer some vaccinations, flu vaccines to the attendees of the walk. The New Orleans Health Department and Wal Walgreens partnered with us and they provided COVID and the flu vaccines for 25 of their participants. Dr. Keith Ferdinand was there providing a presentation specifically on heart health because it was a heart health nature um, event but we also took the opportunity to talk to the participants about the benefits of getting the flu vaccine and highlighting at-risk communities. We decided that we were also going to publicize this campaign and offer an incentive of a $20 gift card to the flyers or anyone who decided they wanted to come to the hospital to get the vaccine. Now it can be challenging in New Orleans planning these types of events because we have a number of festivals and Karen will probably address some of these lessons learned um, when we get to our panel discussion. So now how did we determine if we made any difference with this campaign? Well, we asked our state health department with the assistance of our city health department for flu vaccination data in New Orleans Parish to determine if there was a change in the vaccine rates. There were 87,215 people receiving the flu vaccine in 2022 and 2023 flu season, where 89,000, there was a bump, eight, over 89,000 people receiving the flu vaccine in the 2023-2024 flu season, given an overall increase in a number of flu vaccine doses administered in Arlene's Parish. Now, regarding our targeted community before and after our campaign, 3,235 African Americans received the flu shots between January and March. We held the campaign in January, but we wanted to make sure that there was enough time uh, that took place following our educational campaign to determine whether or not there was any differences in flu vaccine um, uh, doses in individuals in New Orleans and the African American community. And as you can see this year, we did have an increase with 4,219 individuals who did receive the flu vaccine after our campaign. So at our state level, excuse me. So at, the, I'm sorry, oops. <laughs> give me a moment. There was a little technical difficulty here. So just give me a moment to get back on track. So the state provided some additional information regarding African Americans who received the, the flu vaccine um, last year during the first quarter. And it was 16,517 African Americans during that time that had um, received those doses. And during, following this campaign for the state, there were 21,496,000 uh, African Americans. So historically, African Americans in Louisiana have underperformed with, with receiving flu vaccinations compared to their white counterparts. But the data show that Louisiana and Arlene's Parish, inclusive of vulnerable populations, have maintained and continue to build momentum around the education and importance of the flu vaccines. So 
We are now ready for our panel discussion. I want to thank you all very much for listening. And also, don't forget to put your questions into the Q&A. So we can come back to the panel now. So what I want to do now, everyone, is to give the panel some questions that they can address regarding their role that they played in conducting this campaign and how important it was for their involvement to make it a successful um, event for us. So Karen, I'd like to start with you and welcome. We saw in bright moments a great communication effort. What was unique about this effort and how did you specifically design your multi-level approaches? Give us the nuts and bolts of how Bright Moments developed this campaign with the Healthy Heart and also our partners. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Daphne. Um, good to see everybody. And um, it's amazing, the partners that we had um, when we went forward and putting um, this project um, on the map, I would say now. Um, one of the things that we do uh, whenever we get a project is that we sit um, and strategize um, to see exactly um, what that outreach will look like, and most importantly, um, the impact that it would have on the community. Um, we was just fresh off of COVID. Um, as a matter of fact, the first one, we actually would wear a mask um, at, the, um, at the event. And we knew through that process, um, the myths and, dis, you know, and misinformation, especially among the African-American community, was weary about anything dealing with um, vaccination. So you know, keeping that as top of mind awareness. One of the things that we did was we thought about, you know, put ourselves in that position and, and, and started to operate as to putting something out that we're focusing on the why. Why do you need to do this? Um, and that became the, the, the foundation of the entire campaign. Um, whereas we're educating people as to why as well as allowing it to be their own decisions um, in managing. Because one of the things that we learned from Dr. Ferdinand uh, when we was doing the, um, the COVID um, outreach was I'm only here to give you information so that you can make an informed decision um, about your family. So the uniqueness of how we presented it was we gave the community ownership of their health by educating them of the importance of, you know, this flu vaccination is just as important as the COVID. Um, it's just that, you know, there's different levels. But I think that was the, the key behind it. And then the second part is who's going to deliver the message. Um, so knowing that we're dealing with, you know, in issues of medicine, we didn't need anybody to make it seem like it was anything glorious because it wasn't. So we went to Dr. Keith Ferdinand, we went to Dr. Vegno, we went to Dr. Davis, and each each person was specifically placed for a particular target group. Dr. Vegno became the face, and as you stated early, working so hard, rolling up her sleeve. When we was dealing with the pandemic here in the city, she was a part of those press conferences, giving us update. Dr. Ferdinand, well-known cardiologist in the city of New Orleans, you know, had a, a clinic actually in the Lower Night Ward, which was a part of our target audience and well-respected. And then we had Dr. Takesha Davis, who is, we saw her as someone that was, you know, that would target a younger audience. And then you had, you know, a Black African-American female that's running a hospital, again, in New Orleans East. So they became what we called our ambassadors. Um, well-known in a community, well-respected. So that right there would get your attention. And then, of course, we started dealing with all of the different media tools that we needed, um, you know, the eye-catching, you know, the phrase flu-ready. And then our thing was, are you flu-ready, NOLA? Um, so it automatically became more of a cultural thing. When you hear NOLA, you know that, you know, this is something that's speaking directly to you. Very good, good. Um, we have a question in the chat regarding our budget and how was it funded? Well, I can answer that one. Um, Laura Lee so graciously gave us a grant from the, the Center for Healthcare Quality 
in sustainability. So we were very, very fortunate to be able to partner with her um, in her organization. Um, altogether, it costs this this campaign costs us forty five thousand dollars. And all of the money went to the campaign. No salaries or anything like that, all to the campaign. So it was all real work. Everything was paid for through the campaign, everything. And of course, you know, Bright Moments did a phenomenal job. We could not have done this without Bright Moments. We really couldn't. In fact, the benefit of having partners um, uh, teaches you some lessons because I wasn't quite sure exactly how we were going to pull this off. I really wasn't sure until one of my partners, St. Kofa, suggested, you really need to get somebody to help you with this, who really know what they're, what they're doing, you know, who've had the experience with pulling off a marketing public relations campaign. So who else would we be able to go to other than a company that has had um, longevity for 40 years in New Orleans, addressing these needs and also helping to rebuild our city after Katrina, but bright moments. And they have the network, the relationships that they have developed over the decades. So we could not fail without being a part of, of this organization. And you, you may have heard that I, I said partnered and contracted, okay? We have we had a contract with them, but our contract is different than 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 doing business with just another um, a company. We have a partnership which makes it distinct, yeah. where we share our vision that's with common goals. We have um, open dialogue and transparency, in communication, and listen. We listen to each other. So that's why I say it is deeper than a, a contract. It is a partnership. And that's how we have developed relationships with all of the uh, people who are representing their organizations on this panel. Because I'll put out there, we like each other. That's one reason <laughs> why it works. And that may sound quite unusual and strange, okay? But we, we all like each other. We like working with one another. And, and that's one reason why we went back to the, the New Orleans Health Department with Meredith. Meredith is always there, available. We have people in New Orleans who are there for us and for one another and support one another. So I, I hope I answered that question for, for that um, you know person who asked about cost. It's expensive, it is. But as you can see with the numbers, um, and we can't, we, we may not know exactly for sure because it's not a controlled um, study or program, but we can observe some differences and we hope to think that the campaign that we delivered made a difference in bumping those numbers up with the vaccinations. Okay, Meredith, Meredith, the New Orleans Health Department has a long history, as I have stated already, of partnering with our local citizens to make a difference. What helps you determine what efforts to partnership should be approached? How can right. people partner with their city health department? Absolutely. I think there are a lot of ways and it depends on the city, but for us in New Orleans, we know that we're in it together. Um, our team is small, but we you know, want to make an impact um, on the health of our community. And I think that's true of many health departments that may be working with small teams and not sure how to partner with community. Um, for us in New Orleans, I think a, a great opportunity that we have is when partners work together to come with that ask. And I think this is a great example of that between Healthy Heart uh, Community Prevention Project and uh, Sankofa and others um, and coming with a unified message and saying this is what we want for you know our residents. And I think uh, for us, we we get a lot of offers of partnership, but when there's an impact driven behind it and kind of a specific call to action within that. So this one, um, you know, targeted our District E uh, Council District, which made it easier for us to communicate that with our partners 
in um, our Office of Neighborhood Engagement at the city level and with our council offices to help promote events too, even, you know, kind of free promotion within newsletters or as people were out in the community. Um, and so I think, you know, coming with kind of a, a key group that you want to reach um, in your population is really helpful. And then finding existing uh, partners who are already working in that space. I know, um, you know, we really value partnerships that already, you know, are working to address public health in different ways and adding on uh, whether that's COVID or flu or another, you know, uh, threat, public health threat of the day. Um, it's always easier if we are working in partnership with communities that are on the ground each and every day, um, whether that is, you know, heart, um, heart health or other topics um, and working in community. Okay, very good, um, Meredith. Also, we were, we needed your support and your help with the state health department in order to get some of those numbers. Can you talk a little bit about um, how uh, different organizations, when working with their, their health department, how can they seek data uh, in order to uh, demonstrate any differences or impact within their program? Absolutely. I think uh, data is something we all want and we want it to mean something. And so I think being able to know the the person or organization that holds that information for us, that's the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, in relation to uh, vaccines and our statewide immunization record. Um, and so really it was about knowing uh, the, the process for requesting that information, knowing the exact questions we wanted to ask um, within that. So I think having a specific ask up there as well in terms of time period, the locations we were looking at, um, you know, the population specifically, and being able to work with that team at the state level to request that information um, in a timely manner was very you know, helpful. And I know that not all health departments are structured in that way where they have a centralized registry of immunization records, but that is one uh, you know, great benefit that we had pre-COVID. Uh, it's been around for a long time, the link system in Louisiana, um, and that helped us you know, to determine some of these numbers. Very good. Thank you, Meredith. Rashida, Sankofa is unique in your history of addressing food deserts, the environment, and community service. Why Sankofa added vaccine awareness to their wide portfolio? And also, can you also provide any input regarding the promotional campaign only, or earlier this year with regards to the role that you all served in in supporting the campaign? Yeah, we um, decided to include vaccines in our work because we directly reached community stakeholders through our food access work and community services. We're located in a neighborhood um, where people don't have direct access to a lot of services in um, walking or even sometimes um, driving distance. And so this was an opportunity to connect with diverse groups of partners who were invested in health education and health equity to be a community-based space that can provide those types of important um, resources. We also found that um, being a space of information and education was really significant. Um, many people were uh, really cautious about um, being vaccinated. Uh, did not take flu vaccines, definitely um, weren't sure about a COVID vaccine. And having people who were relatable, um, who were a part of their community, um, who also had some, um, we could say professional, you know, professional leadership um, and trusted source space were very, you know, supportive and, and helpful in connecting people to this resource. So there were people who had never taken a flu vaccine before who um, actually were able to have that um, opportunity when we held the drive in our at our community center, um, but also being a, a link to connecting people to the um, drive at another community center in our neighborhood at the Sanchez where the larger um, flu vaccine and, and COVID drive took place. So we just see this as a part of our overall health a preventative health and health equity um, mission to um, just provide those additional resources that support um, people's longevity, wellness, mortality, and so forth. Rashida, 
Sankofa also has a quite a bit of experience with engaging partners um, that you mentioned before and building coalitions you know, within your organization. Can you talk a bit about the strategies or framework for building these relationships with nonprofits, private, and government organizations as we, as we did in the Flu Ready NOLA campaign? And how do you think Sankofa influenced the campaign? Well, you know, I think, you know, New Orleans being a small town is we all know each other. And so we are familiar with each other's work. And um, once we say, well, maybe we can work with this group or that group, there's still some relationships that are built in. So that familiarity and that trust factor was really important to the approach to the coalition. We didn't have multiple um, coalition meetings to get to know one another. We just understood each other's work and um, had a, a, a confidence in the ability to execute execute the project. But we we do really rely on partnerships um, in our work at Sankofa. We look at groups. It could be um, government institutions, municipal representatives, CDC nonprofits, NGOs, businesses, community stakeholders. But we all want to be mission aligned. Um, so it's in, not only being a, a clinic or a, a government constituent that entails our um, consideration or um, follow up to make sure we we solidify a partnership. It's really making sure that we all are doing the same thing. We might be reaching that goal from different pathways, but we all are going to the same place. And so that 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 was important for us. So we do rely on partnerships to do the diverse amount of work that we do, our intervention, interventions require best practices from many, many groups with technical expertise. How do you feel that Sankofa influenced our campaign? Think about the first one that we had in 2022 when we brought everyone together, all of these partners that we met at Sankofa's office, all 12 partners just about. Tell us about how, you know, what part you all played with, that was so instrumental in bringing us together. Yeah, I would say, you know, for groups that are organizations, groups, you don't have to be a formal group, but if you want to do something like this and you're doing um, some grassroots work or you're doing community development and planning work um, is to, you know, make sure that you're reaching the people who, who live in a neighborhood or who are um, really um, supportive and committed to seeing growth in a neighborhood. But those those stakeholders, those residents, they're critical to making sure that this your work is successful. So we we approach our work by listening and learning, being seeing our community partners and stakeholders, residents, we can those residents as community partners, as wisdom bearers, as those um, living experts. Uh, they may have various areas of expertise or experience from their um, their jobs, workforce, what they do with their families, um, you know, who they know. Um, so we we made sure that we linked those those different diverse people together and um, welcome, you know, what they could bring to the table. So I would say that's what we brought. We brought those people who were networked in in the neighborhood, but also the relationships that we had with. Um, you know, solidified groups outside the neighborhood as well. Yeah, and we were very grateful uh, to that, really and truly. Um, before I get to Dr. Williams, I want to try to address some of the questions that are in the Q and A. Uh, Jeff Stone, you have um, you have three questions in here, and I hope we may have answered one of them. But you asked, um, do we have a classic profit and loss spreadsheet or other documentation to show overhead costs and budget? And uh, Karen, I may have to link that to you. Um, is that something that you all use or 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 need it in order to, uh, you know, coordinate this campaign? So basically, definitely a budget. Um, and what we do is we um, decide where we're going to go heavy. If we're going to go heavy with television, radio. Um, so within that budget, whatever that whole number is, we present to the client what percentage of each item, line item, um, that we're going to be um, doing placement so that they can see exactly um, where to, how their dollars are being spent. And then we also give information as um, Ms. Daphne shared, you know, what you receive from there, how many impressions, how many, how many people you reach, how many clicks that you had. 
um, so that you can see a return on your investment. Um, and I think for that small dollar um, amount, I think um, we got way more than, um, you know, if you had w more money, um, you probably would had more exposure. But since this was a specific target area, um, I think we did extremely well um, with the amount of money that we had um, to invest in this particular campaign. But um, and then at the end of the day, we, you know, our we, you know, this is not necessarily a profit and loss. It's just to make sure that you come under budget or right on budget um, because <laughs> nobody is actually profiting for this. But except for the community um, yes. and getting the awareness and the, um, and the vaccination. That's right. Very good. Karen, I totally agree. Jeff also wanted to know the overhead for billboards, podcast fees to load to proprietary sites like Pandora, Spotify, iHeart and other and did we get donations for these? No, we did not get donations, Jeff. We only used the budget that we got from the grant. That was it. <laughs> and if we did go over, then I would have taken it out of my budget, okay, if we needed something for something else, okay? <laughs> so, Karen, the, I, I guess you may have addressed that already in terms of any overhead for billboards and stuff, no? Yeah, so... Um billboards was you know part of the um placement but and we were able to one of the things that we do that's unique um is we work with because you know jerice who's not here she's normally would be sitting in this seat but she mm -hmm. is on pto and um she does amazing work um she's been with us for um 25 years and her relationship with um media partners is the reason why uh, we are able to, you know, get as much as we do. I mean, sometimes she give us, um, you know, the feedback on, you know, you know, with, you know, say like Cox Media, if we blew in a placement on that, I'm like, what? Um, but what happens with our partners is that we explain exactly what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and for this particular campaign, so say like with billboards, one of the things that we did, we work with our rep, whereas we might have a week on at this location, and then that billboard would move to a week in another location. So it made it seem like it had the illusion that we were having billboards all over the place, but we really weren't. And because of the fact that you can do digital now, um, which is something that we went to, which is less expensive than a static board, which is the one that's just constantly up, that helped out tremendously. And then the other part, which was, you know, you know, we have it in our, you know, um, Q and A, but another part that we did that was really, really essential um, and major um, is with our TV reps and radio representatives that we um, work directly with. Um, we were able to get them to do um, the commercial as a PSA. So for everything that we purchased, they also added it because they saw it, they saw it as something that was important for the community to be aware of. So they added it as a public service announcement um, and that helped us. But everything was based on how we st strategize, bringing up you know, why this should happen and brought it to them that way. And that's what literally gave us so much earned um, media. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Williams, as a physician and director of the Health Ministry of Greater St. Stephen, what role has the church played with campaigns such as ours in promoting community health? And what steps should an organization take to partner with the church? You're on, mute. You're on mute, Dr. Williams. Hey, hey everybody. Uh, yeah, the church plays a significant role in terms of this. Uh, the, the main role that the church plays is, is acting as a host. Just the church itself being a host is, is important, you know, because it's a central location for most communities and it's a trusted uh, place for people to go. And, uh, and, it provides, uh, it gives us an opportunity to provide the the health and education, and, and it's one of the things I really emphasize at our at our church, education, 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 because you know what's inside of people's heads is, is how they make their decisions. So I really emphasize that more above uh, most things, and and that would include, uh, you know, encouraging um, the the sermons to correlate with what we're what we're uh, trying to emphasize. Bible studies, newsletters, social media, and those those are the the things that the church also provides. Um, 
and you know being able to use the message that resonate with with those people uh you know that resonate in faith-based uh values you know just talking with people and saying look this shows love by you getting vaccinated you're showing love for those who are vulnerable you know such as your elderly you know if we you know and you just try to make it plain to them and also collaborating with the uh, health professions as a physician you know i i can bring in my colleagues and uh you know and we we can uh, provide a venue to answer questions you know experts in their field and so and and we can also do workshops seminars and all those th things help to bridge the gaps you know between the knowledge that that people have as far as hesitancy for for uh, getting vaccinated and it also offers logistic support um transportation um and even helping people fill out applications uh you know you know just filling out the forms and and just finding any kind of barriers uh just you know trying to dissect what barriers that keep people away from uh or doing such things you know as getting simple simple things as getting vaccinated and we also like to promote the the holistic uh, approach to the health you know we we tell them look it's uh it's it's something that's important for both your physical and your spiritual. And, you know, I try to make it clear to people that the immune system is all related. This is something that God gives us to fight off the evil things that the devil puts in there like diseases. And so those those are those are key things in role, you know, the role that the church plays as far as that. Thank you, Dr. In terms of the steps that uh you know, to answer that question, the steps that 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 the organization takes. First, establish the trust. You know, you got to establish trust and and that mutual respect for the kind uh, for the community, and um, and we do this. You know, we start by building that relationship with the church leaders. You know, the partnership with them and align. I actually establish meetings. You know, I I set up meetings with the bishop of the church. Uh, before it was Bishop Morton, which a lot of people know, um, you know, he was someone that that I treated. And so he always talks about it in his sermon and he talks about, it, you know, he lets the people know that that, you know, as a, now I'm not only a physician, you know, that I'm a Christian physician and, you know, you, you know, he, he just encourages people. To, and that that kind of establishes the, the trust there. People trust me not only as a physician, but they know that, you know, I'm a, a, a God fearing person. So that, that helps a lot as well. And, um, and, you know, that collaboration and education, um, just, just, uh, doing it on a consistent basis and, and also providing the resources, you know, um, when you provide the resources for them, uh, you, you're overcoming barriers, um, doing, you know, like the transportation and that type of thing. And sometimes it involves me finding a sponsor, you know, you, if you can find sponsors to help to do these events, um, that's also helpful. You know, you start doing giveaways and things like that. And to maintain that open relationship, uh, the open communication, doing it on a regular basis. Um, I'm, I'm always there. The people always see me there. You know, they know that the interest is to educate them. And, you know, when we have things in the, in the back of the church, you know, sometimes we have events after the church and, you know, we have things where we have to, uh, we serve food and so forth. You know, when they serve something bad, most of the people, they're already trying to hide the food from if it's bad food and that kind of thing, you know. So I know that, you know, I know that I, I'm getting the mutual respect from people that, and they are listening, you know, so, and they'll come and tell me, I, Dr. William, I know I'm not supposed to be eating this, but, you know. And so that that's that relationship you kind of develop with the, you know, with the community, with the congregation. Thank you, Dr. Williams. There's um, another question in the chat, but before I get to that, um, I'd like to throw this out to the panel. How can we sustain a program like this? What does it take to sustain it over time, year after year? and to keep the momentum going and just to keep the program going itself, what do we, what do we need to do? Well, it's, um, as far as sustaining it, um, basically 
being consistent is one thing. Uh, if you're consistent and and you're clear with your educational goals, uh, and I always try to make sure that everybody's clear eyed on everything. I I try to break it down in layman's terms, and people really appreciate that, and that that helps establish more uh, more trust as well. And so that consistency is, is really important, and engaging um, the trust and the community leaders. You know, I think that. Uh, you know, the pastors, of course, of the churches. And and like Dr. Kesey Ferdinand is, is a very trusted person in the community. People know that he's genuine. And so, you know, I keep them engaged, you know, inviting them to do talks at the church and, and so forth. And he's always, he always acknowledges, if I come to his church, he'll acknowledge, he can say, I always acknowledge my colleagues and so forth. And so then the whole community gets to kind of know, not just the persons there in their church, but the, the ones outside there. And, and so we kind of make it that family thing that you talked about earlier, you know, and, and people liking each other and that kind of thing. And so, <laughs> so that's important. And also the, the accessibility um, and, and the, the convenience, you know, uh, the church is a, a convenient place for most communities because it's centrally located. Most people can come there. And so when you host things there, uh, you know, that makes it easier. And, uh, and also, you know, the schools and the community centers and so forth, we, we, we also encourage that. And, and then addressing the, the concerns of the community is important, like the, the misconceptions we know, uh, mm. we, we first, I like to acknowledge, I say, look, I know, uh, you know, my ancestors were part of that, uh, that Tuskegee experiment. So, you know, I'm not going to, ask you to do anything I wouldn't do myself. You know, I okay. get the vaccination. And so you you know that I know the inside of it. You know, I'm educated in that. And so we have to help them to dis, you know, to dismiss those those myths and and those fears that they have of, you know, they, they'll tell you, I don't want to be a guinea pig. And some of the people have the, you know, like with the COVID thing when they were talking about the aluminum uh, in the, you know, the aluminum metals in the, in the vaccines. And I have to, you know, educate them and say, look, aluminum is not a bad thing. That's, that's really part of your, just like calcium and all those things, they're part of your body makeup. And some, some of those things are used to stabilize the, you know, the, the vaccine and so forth. And, and when you educate people that way, uh, you know, then they'll start to reconsider, you know, what myths they had and the hesitation that they had for these things. And so uh, addressing those misconceptions is really important. And then just the, you know, the ongoing uh, partnerships is important. Doing it on an annual basis. Uh, people see you there all the time. So they say, like, he really cares. They, they really care about us. And so that's how I would address that. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, I want to, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, with the uh, with the webinar, and Jeff has asked a question, and this might be our last question because I want all of you all to um, give some input because you all may have some perspective about it. What failed, and what would you not do again? And he put "not" in capital letters. Okay, "not do again," and this may it may be tied to some of our lessons learned, you know, as well. Okay, what do we learn from that, but what we would not do again? Meredith. <laughs> sure, I can start. Um, yeah, and just for your, also your experience with doing flu vaccine campaigns, sure. that could be helpful too. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like we've had a lot of missteps in, in vaccines, but um, I actually, with this campaign, I think overall it was kind of how we intended. I would say for us, um, if I was thinking specific to the flu ready campaign um, in 2024, when we did the the in person event, it was it was highly impactful in the sense that it pulled in people who are on the heart walk and they were stopping in for a different event. Um, you know, it was maybe a little bit more low traffic of an area yeah. than we would normally go for, but I do think it was helpful for having conversations. So, I think you know, as we're thinking about vaccine events, it's like thinking about ways that you can set it up where you can have those intimate, like one-to-one -one conversations, but also looking for opportunities where there are just more people, more high, like more high traffic spaces. Cause I think for our community partners, 
particularly community pharmacies that are coming out, they they really have the expectation that they're going to come and do you know 200 plus vaccines, and that may or may not be the case. And so, kind of expectation setting with those partners that you know a successful day might look like 20 or 30 people compared to you know what we saw in early COVID or you know, flu kind of practices where it might have been, you know, hundreds of people. So I think for us, it's a, it's a lot of expectation setting and still saying that, you know, 20 can be a win, um, it, it, depending on the situation. Okay. Karen, do you have any input with regards to what we should not do again and any lessons learned? I think the one thing uh, that was brought to my attention, um, the timing. Um, you don't want to get involved with it in the height of the season because you're trying to be proactive. Um, so I think, um, you know, that's a, that's, that plays a major role. Um, and then also look at it uh, beyond just, you know, that particular season, like how do we prepare people, continue to educate them. Um, and then also, you know, what kind of takeaway they can have, you know, something that, you know, like, um, you know, you go to certain places and it tells you, you know, if you, you know, you have a stuffy nose or whatever's going on with your body to be able to recognize those things and then, you know, act upon it immediately. So some type of takeaway that people can have once they get, you know, out, you know, outside of that great gift card, you know, here are the symptoms, the signs, how you can keep your, your family healthy, you know, healthy eating. Um, St. Kofa always would have like, you know, fruit or something just to give them something that's beyond that, I think that would be um, my take on lessons learned and what we can add. Okay. Do you think that we are changing vaccine acceptance in the Black community? I think you still have a large number of people that are hesitant, and that's yeah. just going to be in general. They're just not going to go. They, they only go to the doctor, and we learn this working with New Orleans East Hospital, if there's an emergency, they think going to the emergency room is like, you know, taking care of your health. Um, so that's going to be something. And it's based on everything that we have been dealing with. And to be honest with you, even when we go for, you know, treatments, those of us that are educated and understanding, um, you know, educated about getting your health, um, be, being proactive about your health, we're still dealing with a lot of, um, you know, racisms within the health um um, you know, you look at mort mortality with um, pregnant women, um, especially women of color, that rate is so high. Um, and then you just have people that feel like if I go to the hospital, I'm not going to come out, you know, that's where, you know, so there's a fear factor. Um, so it's much deeper than just, you know, this moment. But I think what we're doing and chipping away at it, at least for this particular portion of it and seeing people like, you know, Dr. Ferdinand, Dr. Vegno, Dr. Davis, that they can relate to, at least, you know, like Meredith was saying, you, at least you're starting to have those conversations, but it's yeah. so deeper, it's so deep, so. Okay, well, I, I think we have come to an end of our webinar. Ashley, I would need you all to lead us out, um, if possible, because it is 12 noon in New Orleans, one o'clock at in your time, Eastern Standard Time, so we really do appreciate every single one of you for attending our webinar. I want to thank our illustrious panel of partners for attending this, this webinar and giving such wonderful input on how to contract, develop, coordinate a flu vaccine campaign with marketing and um, a promotional uh, uh, multi-channel approaches. So um, I just want to uh, thank you all so very, very much for attending. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Bye.